thank you all for um, being here tonight. I hope you can hear my voice. If you can't, I'll use a mic, but I, I think my voice projects well enough. Um, the topic tonight is, can wind power allow us to meet net zero emissions? With a subtitle of, how do we maximize value to Ireland of offshore wind? Uh, and this presentation is the work of of a number of people, including for uh, Richie O'Shea, David Wall, Arkesman Bosey, Richard Ling, Chen Deng, and a whole group of people. So it's a narrative around our research, uh, mainly carried out by our great PhD students. Uh, and afterwards, we'll have talks from uh, Brendan Tuhi, who's the chair of Airgrid, to give a, a commercial perspective, a real world perspective of what we are talking about. Um, so my name is Jerry Murphy, I'm the Professor of Civil Engineering and I'm the Director of the Marai Centre since 2015. Uh, and the Marai Centre is uh, it's a whole systems approach. We have 250 researchers in 13 universities. We work together, so we have electrical engineers, microbiologists, ecologists, and it gives us a very different perspective on problems. Uh, and we do spend a lot of time looking at the area of the offshore environment. We look at, um, we tag dolphins and seals and birds, and we have an understanding of the ocean. Um, we also look at the environment of the ocean and putting things in the water, which is quite a challenge. At the moment, beyond 12 and a half nautical miles, we don't yet have a planning permission process or it's just starting. So again, we have lawyers within the MARI system. So we get a lot of expertise. And the challenge I want to look at today is using the power of the ocean to decarbonize society and hopefully to make jobs for Irish people for within Ireland. Um, I suppose I, I have some fears which I'll, I'll speak about as I go on. Uh, this is a quote from George Bernard Shaw. Uh, it's used by J.F. Kennedy when he addressed the doll. It was used by Robert Kennedy in his presidential campaign. It was used by Ted Kennedy at his brother's funeral. Uh, and I think it's quite nice, and I think it reflects a lot of what we do in research. So some people see things as they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. And I suppose as academics, we spend a bit of time looking at things that we would like to happen, and they're not really happening. And this, I suppose, is what I spend a lot of my time thinking about. This is the canvas that we work on, and I hope during this talk that I introduce the topics piece by piece, and it's an integrated circular economy system, and I think it's something that's important for, for Ireland. So within MRI, we host the National Ocean Test facility, we have four wave tanks. Uh, one of them is 35 meters long. We can put waves that we design down the basin up to a meter high. So at a scale of one is to 10, that's a 10 meter wave. And we've done a lot of testing of offshore devices, of floating offshore wind, of oscillating wave columns, of offshore wind with um, wave columns at the base. So we have a lot of knowledge, and this is led by my good colleague, Jimmy Murphy. Uh, and we do coordinate a lot of the ocean test facilities within Europe. So we're looking at an ESFRI, a European Strategic Research Cluster. So we have a huge challenge coming up, and, and my friends in Airgrid would be more aware than many. Uh, Ireland's electricity grid has already experienced and sustained some of the highest system non-synchronous penetration in any national electricity grid. Now this is very simplified. Like what it means is the portion of wind energy over the system demand. I think we've achieved 75% or more. And this is a huge challenge. So Ireland is an island. It's not like we're France and we're connected to Germany. We are an island. We're not that connected. We are the definition of an island grid. And the more variable renewable electricity we have, now this is not my expertise, I'm, I'm aware there's experts in the audience, but the more variability we have, the more challenging it is to the electricity grid. And I understand we have built a very large flywheel in Money Point for a cost of 150 million to overcome inertia. So if I just say there's a challenge, 
there's a challenge in the electrical distribution system. And we're now targeting seven gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. And there's also the Dublin declaration of 260 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050 in northern seas. So this variability in the production of electricity is going to increase and increase. And we're looking now, and I was reading, we're, we're in a phase where we're going to have offshore wind turbines potentially by 2028. Uh, and they're looking at less of them and higher. So when we started with wind turbines back in the 1990s, they were probably a megawatt at most. We talk about 10 megawatts, it's now 15 megawatts. And these devices are up to 345 meters high. So this is one of the uh, wind turbines. The hub height is 150, the radius of the rotor is 120, that's 270, and you have another 75. They're massive. They're the size of the Eiffel Tower. And when we're looking at seven gigawatts, what that means is 467 15 megawatt turbines in the Irish waters by 2030. So I'm a civil engineer and I just think this is incredible. And one of my graduates in 2012 has to write a method statement of a 15 megawatt turbine, having it in a harbor, picking it up with a crane, putting it on a big steel box, floating it out into the ocean and anchoring it. So it's massive. I mean, it's huge infrastructure. And as a civil engineer, I'm delighted because all of my graduates are going to be employed in Ireland, hopefully, and this is my challenge. And I suppose the issues we would have is the port infrastructure. I mean, I, I don't believe the port infrastructure is in place. I don't think we have access in a port to drop something of 250 meters high and a crane to pick it up. So we have problems and I, I worry about is somebody else thinking about this, or is it just me that's waking up in the middle of the night thinking about this? Um, and this is what's proposed. In a, so seven projects have got marine area consent. I think that totals 4.5 megawatts. They will survey their waters, and they will then go into an auction for 2.5 gigawatts of offshore wind, which is expected to be in the water by 2027. And we're starting really on the east coast, shallower water. We're starting within 12 and a half nautical miles because we don't have a planning permission yet, I think, outside 12 and a half nautical miles. There's one up here on Connemara, I think, which is part of phase one. And that's expected to secure 2.5 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2027. This is Ireland's electricity, renewable electricity system. Uh, we're over five gigawatts in 2020. Uh, and this black line is the installed capacity. This is constraint and this is curtailment. Really what it means is that we've got to about 5.5 gigawatts predominantly of onshore wind. And doing that, we've dispatched down about 11.5 or 12%. So because it might be really windy on a summer night when we're all in bed, turbines are blowing, nobody's using it, we spill it, we dispatch it down. So when we add another seven to that to get us to 13 gigawatts, it's going to be more of a challenge. So the electricity may not be produced when we want it to be produced. And this brings us to gas and it brings us to hydrogen. There is a perspective that gas can be a battery for electricity. So we have a target in 2030 for two gigawatts of hydrogen. And gas is important because up to twice as much energy is taken from the gas grid than the electricity grid. If you look at the food and beverage sector, production of ammonia, production of methanol, we use an awful lot of gas. And you can see from the war in Ukraine, there was huge challenges in Germany and Austria. I think 100% of Austrian gas came from Russia. And what natural gas to me is, it's hydrogen. So they're after the H. So Germany brings in natural gas and produces ammonia, NH3. So the H3 comes from methane, CH4. They make methanol, so the H3 comes from natural gas. So there's now a challenge in Europe that where are they going to get their H from, the hydrogen molecule? And there is a perspective. We've had lots of visits from the, um, the German trade associations and the Dutch trade associations. We had the Minister for Energy from the Netherlands saying, how much hydrogen can you give us? When, when Ireland is sorted, what will you give us? So there is a perception in Europe that our offshore wind 
will give them the hydrogen molecule so they can continue their industries. Um, so it's a challenge. And I suppose the question I would raise is, should we give them our hydrogen or our electricity, or should we do other things within Ireland? We've done a lot of work over the years on, on modeling and looking at what things look like. I, I do get concerned when people talk about hydrogen for a dollar a kilogram. You know, there's these fantastic, brilliant, evangelical, visionary, it'll be really cheap, it'll be free. Um, so we modeled an offshore wind farm, and the idea was you sell electricity when it's in demand, and the price drops when it's not in demand, and you then go for hydrogen. So we looked at roughly four cent a kilowatt hour and below is used to make hydrogen. And in our model, that would give us 11.3 cent per kilowatt hour of hydrogen. And, and one thing, there is a viewpoint that you can go from electricity to hydrogen and back to electricity. If you do that uh, and you take your hydrogen at 11 cent a kilowatt hour and bring it back to electricity, you're looking at 18 cent a kilowatt hour. So you've increased the price by a factor of four of going from electricity to hydrogen and back to electricity. What we have looked at is that that hydrogen at 11 cent a kilowatt hour is roughly 110 per liter of diesel. And if it goes into a fuel cell, which is more efficient, it's about a euro per liter of diesel. So we do see an economic pathway of offshore wind to hydrogen to transport fuel. We struggle with the economic pathway of offshore wind to hydrogen and back to electricity. Now, I do understand there's a proposal for a very large uh, storage facility, 20 days storage, and the idea is it would be dispatchable. So on those 20 days in winter when it gets down to minus 6 and minus 7 and there's no wind, your hydrogen is stored offshore, 20 days storage, and when there's no wind, it comes back. Um, it will be expensive, but we do have problems with dispatchability. So when the wind isn't blowing for those 20 days in winter when it gets really cold, what are we doing for electricity if we don't have fossil fuel or hydrocarbons? So what we've been doing includes trying to figure out what would this look like. So we looked at an electrolyzer to make hydrogen. So we're splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. And we're looking at HVDC cables. Now at the moment, Ireland is bringing a a 0.72 gigawatt HVDC cable from France to Ireland at a cost of about 1.6 billion. So if we're looking at seven gigawatts of offshore wind, these HVDC cables will be expensive. And there is a time period to wait to get them and to put them in the water. And I understand that they're typically max out at about a gigawatt. So we looked at the idea of having the electrolyzer on the wind farm. So number one, you could put it on the wind turbine. Now you're looking again at a 15 megawatt turbine, size of the Eiffel Tower. You've got a battery because the electrolyzer needs electricity. You've got a desalination unit because you need clean water. And then you've got the electrolyzer. So you're looking at a factory 65 kilometers off the west coast of Ireland, size of the Eiffel Tower, battery, electrolyzer, desalination unit, and you're now piping hydrogen. And our understanding is you can pipe a lot more energy as hydrogen than you can put through a cable. And then we had another concept because they normally like these spar wind turbines rather than a submerged. So you could have one platform, one electrolyzer for all of the wind turbines to send the electricity to. But you would then have a bruny discharge because you'll have a desalination unit. And is that going to be environmentally detrimental to the ocean? So there are lots of considerations. Um, and it's quite plausible that we could have this in the East Coast and the hydrogen could go to Britain and not to Ireland. So we could be supplying an export market. And when we look at hydrogen, it's what do we do with that hydrogen in the future? Uh, my understanding again is phase one and phase two of offshore wind will be to supply our electricity demands, which might be 10 gigawatt capacity but we're going to go way beyond that. So what are we doing with all of that energy from the ocean? Do we just have a HVDC cable into Europe? Do we make hydrogen? Um, and a lot of what we do is power to X. Uh, so power to something. 
So it can be methane. We can convert hydrogen to methane with the addition of a C. We can make methanol. Uh, so we capture carbon at a distillery or a creamery and react the carbon with the hydrogen from an electrolyzer. And methanol will be the transport fuel of shipping. So shipping of the future will run on renewable methanol. And there's 110 million tons produced worldwide from natural gas. And if we're getting rid of natural gas, it should be from renewable hydrogen, which should come from offshore wind. Ammonia, NH3, it's fertilizer. So we put fertilizer on the soil, NH3, it comes from natural gas. Um, it's a steam expansion. So we're putting natural gas on, on our land. So we could make renewable ammonia. So we could get that H from offshore wind, react with nitrogen in the Haber-Bosch process, and you have ammonia, which is not fossil, which is not from natural gas. Now, where things are difficult, and, and this is where sometimes knowing too much can get you a little upset, if you put that fertilizer in the soil, you still have emissions because there's little bacteria there, nitrosomonas and nitrobacter, and they give off N2O, which is 310 times more global warming than CO2. So even having renewable fertilizer, you will still have emissions off the soil, but it will be reduced by about 70%. Another area is steel. We have a production of 2 billion tons per annum on the planet. It's 8% of all greenhouse gas. We're going to put all these steel turbines in the ocean. Why don't we produce steel? And the only way to decarbonize steel and get rid of a blast furnace is hydrogen. So I want to look a little bit um, at methane, because we are talking about hydrogen to methane to methanol to fisher troughs diesel. So I want to look a little bit at anaerobic digestion, which is a very well understood technology. And in the Climate Action Plan, there's a target of 7.5 terawatt hours of biomethane by 2030, which is equivalent to 223 megawatt biogas plants. So there's going to be another industry producing biogas, which is methane and carbon dioxide. And one of the things that is quite important, if you want to make methanol from offshore wind with hydrogen, the sea needs to be biogenic. It's not that you're capturing carbon from a coal plant and putting that carbon with hydrogen. It should be biogenic. So this is one of the best sources of biogenic CO2 to give you a renewable hydrocarbon. This is an anaerobic digester. This is quite a small one. So we're probably looking at of that scale, there'll probably be about 600 in the country, lots of digesters. Uh, and in terms of the microbiology, you start off with silage or slurry, it's a solid. You liquefy it, you ferment it to volatile fatty acids, and then you convert it to methane and carbon dioxide. What's quite nice about this technology, there's also in the Climate Action Plan this idea of organic farming. Uh, and this is an organic farm in Denmark. And when you have an organic farm, there's no more synthetic fertilizer. You can't put fertilizer on the soil. You can't put weed killer on the soil. So this farm, uh, they have a little device behind the tractor and people pick the weeds. Um, but what happens is the yield of the crop drops. So you need some form of fertilizer. And what they do here is they built an anaerobic digestion facility. They digested all their dungs and they made that into a fertilizer. So it, it mineralizes the nutrients. So their yields go back up. But in this farm, they were certified as minus 0.82 kilograms CO2 per litre of milk. So you've got an organic farm, you're producing biogas, you're producing fertilizer, you're reducing the emissions from the cattle slurry. So it's categorized as greenhouse gas negative, and it's organic. So we would see this as a future in Ireland for our organic farms. We've looked at logistics of what I like here in Denmark is back in 2010, they decided in 2030 they won't spread slurry on the land. So they're not spreading slurry because it causes pollution of waterways. Um, there's fugitive emissions. So by 2020, half of the slurry in Denmark is digested and is converted into methane, which is used as an energy vector. And they have a system of, so a farmer goes to a local pit drops in the slurry, it's augered up to the anaerobic digestion facility, and biofertilizer is augered back. They tend to have an anchor tenant. So you can see here 725,000 tonnes a year of feedstock. So it could be Glanbia, it could be Irish distillers, it could be Dublin City. You get all their organic material, you digest it, you have another line for farming, for slurries, and you put the meat then into the gas grid. 
This is one I quite like. If you remember at the start of, of Brexit, there was a lack of CO2 in Britain. There was no CO2. Um, CO2 tends to come from ammonia production from natural gas. They couldn't slaughter animals because when you bring an animal to a slaughter facility, put in CO2 and you make the animal docile. Um, and the market in Denmark for CO2 is 65,000 tons per annum. So in hospitals, in meat packing. So what was happening in Britain is the pigs were getting older and the farmers were killing them and it was too old to eat. So in Denmark, they produce sustainable CO2 from the biogas facility. So the biogas is separated into the methane, which goes to the gas grid. CO2 goes through a seven-step process. So it goes into your water, it goes into your beer, uh, packing your meat into the hospital. So it's supplying a market. So there is a market for CO2. So anaerobic digestion is important for fertilizer, waste treatment, CO2. And, and how do these match up? So we've spoken about hydrogen and we've spoken about biogas. So we bring them together here. This is a, a facility in Wurtel in the north of Germany. Lots of offshore wind, poor distribution system to the south of Germany. So there is a food waste digester that digests food waste Methane goes to the gas grid, CO2 is left behind. They built a six megawatt electrolyzer for the electricity to make hydrogen. They don't pay for the electricity because it's spilled to them. And they react the hydrogen with the CO2. So you have four moles of hydrogen, one mole of CO2 is methane and water. So the CO2 comes from the biogas, the hydrogen comes from the offshore wind, and they're producing synthetic methane which they sell as a, a very, very sustainable fuel, transport fuel. So we're biological engineers, and when you look at anaerobic digestion, we have this relationship, it's um, hydrogenotrophic methanogenic archaea. These guys eat hydrogen and carbon dioxide, and they produce methane. In this facility, it's a chemical process at 400 degrees Celsius. So as, as academics, this is very interesting. Bugs do this. Uh, it's also quite, for the chemist here, exothermic. It's Gibbs free energy is highly negative, meaning it's a very positive reaction. Loads of energy. So we started feeding anaerobic broth, hydrogen and carbon dioxide, and we're getting almost 90% efficiency in the methane production. And this is the reaction, 4H2, CO2, methane and water. They're methanothermobacterium wolfi, and wolfi is the Latin for tungsten. So we add a little bit of tungsten, they work a bit better. So we have bugs that convert hydrogen and carbon dioxide to methane. Um, what we then did is we wanted to see what it would look like in the real world rather than a little batch reactor. So we designed and modeled the system based on one reactor where we fed it hydrogen and carbon dioxide in a continuous process. Um, and the output wasn't perfect. Hydrogen doesn't go into solution very readily, so we had to have a pressurized system recirculate the gas so the hydrogen would go into solution, the bugs could get at it. And we had a cascading system, we modeled this, uh, and we found we needed three. So each reactor was getting better and better and better. Uh, and this is what we built then in the laboratory. This is Davis's uh, PhD, Davis Rosmanis. So we've all one or two or three, the same as these three guys. Uh, and what we found is that the first reactor was okay, second reactor was better, in the third reactor, we're getting 97% conversion. So we can take hydrogen from offshore wind, CO2 from a distillery, and make pure methane. Um, so applications of this, we were looking at, there's about 12,000 anaerobic reactors in Germany. If they put electrolyzers and these, what we call ex situ biomethanation systems there, all of the CO2 in the biogas becomes methane. And typically, biogas is 50% CO2, so you're doubling the methane output. You're also upgrading the gas to pure methane, and you're putting it into the gas grid. Um, so this is Denmark, and it's a colleague of mine, Ole Helvepund, runs a company called Nature Energy. I think he's been bought out by Shell. But his reactors supply, at the moment, 35% of the natural gas in Denmark. So big, big anaerobic reactors, typically food waste, creameries, pig farms. Um, and the addition to this is he's going to put electrolyzers and ex situ biomethanation, which will greatly improve the methane output. And by 2030, they will have a fully decarbonized gas grid in Denmark. And they expect to go beyond that. So it's renewable methane 
from offshore wind and CO2 and from slurries and dungs and food waste. And in Denmark, there's no crops. They only use byproducts. We were then thinking, if we brought an electrolyzer into Cork in terms of planning permission, what would we do? How would we get people not to be upset? Uh, we know what happened up in Mayo. So we thought Cara Grenon, Cork Main Drainage. I, I worked on that in 1992. I haven't been there since. How many, just a show of hands, how many people have been in Cara Grenon, Cork Wastewater Treatment Plant? One. Two. So it's, it's quite isolated. So we thought we'd put an electrolyzer in the wastewater treatment plant. And we sized it based on the oxygen demand for the basin. So it requires, um, aeration basins require air, in particular oxygen. And if you pump oxygen instead of air, you reduce the pumping by a factor of five. You get rid of the nitrogen. So we needed a 10 megawatt electrolyzer to give us the oxygen required for that basin. The 10 megawatt electrolyzer would deal with curtailment from 144 megawatts of offshore wind. The hydrogen produced, we'd only need about 22% um, to upgrade the biogas at the existing sludge digesters to get pure methane. And we then would have hydrogen. 78% of the hydrogen is left to do whatever we want to do with that hydrogen. In this case, we looked at hydrogen as a transport fuel and biomethane as a transport fuel. So we could power roughly 400 trucks from methane and hydrogen. And again, this is the work of Davis there in the, in the front. Um, we then started looking at upgrading and other ways to upgrade because an electrolyzer is about 70% efficient. So we started looking at, this is an anaerobic digester. This is power to gas where we have our hydrogen meeting our anaerobic reactor. But we started looking at putting electrodes into the anaerobic reactor. Um, and we pass a current of a volt, and at the cathode, the carbon dioxide is converted to methane. So we're getting pure methane out of the system by putting electricity electrodes into the anaerobic reactor. And the increase in energy is six times the electricity that you put in. So what we're saying here is, rather than having an electrolyzer, pass electricity through the anaerobic digesters, and you'll get almost pure methane, and you'll increase the methane output by 45, 60%. Another area we've been looking at is, is seaweed. So if we're going to have these very, very large offshore wind farms, why not grow seaweed there? Uh, and we've seen a lot of seaweed farms. So this is looking at Laminari digitata, which is a common kelp. So we could take seaweed, and we've looked at We've harvested seaweed in January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Seaweed is like an apple. It, it, it ripens around August. So we get most methane from it. We've also looked at Ascophyllum nodosum. And in Ascophyllum nodosum, which is bladder rack, there's a lot of phenol, which reduces the methane output in summer. So we're looking at biorefineries, where we can take out phenols, we can take out ingredients, and what's left behind, we can make gas. So we're sort of into the biorefinery. Um, We've looked at the biological refinery where that seaweed could be hydrolyzed. So if we break the anaerobic digestion process here, we can make long-chain fatty acids, which have a very high economic value, higher than energy. And we've also looked at the thermal seaweed biorefinery where we produced hydrochar and levinic acid. So lots of money from levinic acid, an awful lot less money from energy. So we're looking at refineries based on seaweed farms, based on the ocean, around these large seaweed farms and offshore wind farms. Another area we've been looking at, and, and this is something we've been looking at in Dingle, the idea of an anaerobic digester producing biogas, and the microalgae will take the CO2 out of the biogas. So you're growing microalgae, and the biogas becomes pure methane. So you're now producing vegan food, you're producing biomethane, and you're producing biofertilizer. Um, so we're changing the system into circular economy systems. We're looking at hydrogen from offshore wind, we're looking at seaweeds, we're looking at microalgae. And then if we look at the end uses, because this is always quite important. One of the projects we've looked at is we've been working with distilleries. And we've been looking at how do you decarbonize distilleries. They typically run on natural gas. So one of the things we looked at was digesting all their byproducts. And those byproducts would be converted into biogas, which would replace 
the natural gas which is used to evaporate water off stillage. We were also looking at the idea of capturing the CO2 from a distillery, reacting with hydrogen and making methane. Uh, we have a paper where we looked at 27 pathways to decarbonize a distillery. And the one thing we found is that electricity is very good at decarbonization up to a certain level. But the problem with distilleries is you have byproducts. You have wet organic material that produces methane. To get beyond 67% decarbonization, we have to digest byproducts. And we're also looking at the idea of those byproducts. Uh, this is a facility in Linkshoping in Sweden where liquefied biomethane runs a truck for 1,000 kilometers. So we could be looking at the biomethane for areas that are not suitable for batteries or for electricity. Then we're looking at power to X, and this is where things become interesting. Um, if you look at methane, it's CH4, and this is methanol, it's CH3OH. So we've added one molecule of oxygen. So if you have a biogas plant with methane and carbon dioxide, you can convert it to methanol. You can also reform methane to carbon monoxide and get hydrogen from offshore wind and make methanol. Um, Porsche have built one of these facilities and their idea is if you want to drive a, a Porsche Boxer from 1985 or if you want a Land Rover running on a sustainable fuel, you can make methanol and use it in the internal combustion engine. So it's not a battery, but the fuel came from electricity. And methanol is now seen as the shipping fuel of the future. So if we're going to decarbonize ships, we will put methanol in those ships. And methanol will be a liquid fuel within the ship. And if that H comes from offshore wind, in essence, the ship is running on electricity that came from hydrogen, that came from an offshore wind. But you have to find a biogenic CO2. And one of the sources would be anaerobic digestion. Another could be uh, a dairy or a uh, distillery or a beer factory or it could be a cement factory. So we're now capturing carbon from industry, reacting it with hydrogen from offshore wind and making a shipping fuel without changing the engine. What we did find in looking at ships and planes is a ship is built for 40 years. A plane is built for 40 years. A plane built now will be in the sky in 2064. You're not going to put a battery on it. It's going to be an internal combustion engine. So making methanol or liquid fuels is probably the only way we overcome shipping and planes and long distance trucks. This is something that's proposed in Germany. Offshore wind, an electrolyzer, um, off heat for district heating, sent the oxygen into a cement factory instead of air, so it's a leaner production, capture the CO2 from the cement factory, react with the hydrogen to make methanol. And then that methanol can be brought into sustainable aviation fuel. So you're looking at offshore wind, green cement, carbon capture, sustainable aviation fuel. So this would be very applicable, for example, to Money Point. Take out Money Point, a gigawatt of coal, stick in a gigawatt electrolyzer, big, big electrolyzer, all the electrical distribution is there, capture CO2 from the cement factory, and make sustainable aviation fuel for Shannon Airport. Areas that are quite important, ammonia. I mean, we produce 150 million tons a year of ammonia from natural gas. It has a byproduct of 430 million tons of CO2 in the production of ammonia. So the idea again would be offshore wind giving us hydrogen. The Haber-Bosch process is we take nitrogen out of the air, react it with hydrogen, and we have renewable ammonia. So when we give out about farmers that they have all these emissions, this is a renewable fertilizer that can be associated with offshore wind. There's also conversations about ammonia being a fuel for shipping. And that's quite difficult and it shows the multivariable complexity. If you have a ship running on ammonia and the ship is in an accident, you get this fog that attacks the respiratory system. So a lot of sailors aren't fond of having ammonia as the shipping fuel. So because of that, methanol is more likely to be the shipping fuel of the future. Uh, this is work we've done looking at decarbonizing ships, planes, and trucks. Uh, and this is utopia. Very, very light, requires no space. Uh, this is the nadir. Very, very heavy, requires lots of space. And down here we have a lithium-ion battery. It's very heavy. It requires lots of space. It's fine in a private car. 
But if you're looking at jet fuel, it's up here. If you're looking at um, methanol to gasoline, it's up here. You want to be up here for shipping, for planes. So the lithium-ion battery is not the solution. You're not going to have a plane taking you from London to Dubai. You're not going to have a battery on a ship going from Shanghai to Rotterdam. So we're going to need hydrocarbons. And if you think we're all on the island of Ireland, and if we leave this island, it's either on a plane, jet fuel, or it's in a ship, the lowest of the low of the oils. So if we want to be green and leave this island, we're going to have to get methanol and put the methanol in the ship so we can think, well, I didn't burn any carbon in my trip. Um, so we do have challenges around hydrocarbons. They are absolutely required, but they need to be green. Yeah, we looked at, uh, at trucks. This is um, Nathan Gray. Uh, and we looked at BED, a battery. We looked at uh, a fuel cell running on hydrogen, and then we looked at electrofuels. But the least amount of energy is required by a battery, three times if you go to a fuel cell. But we found that the battery has a range of about 400 kilometers, where the battery is then too big for the truck. So if we are building trucks, 450 kilometers is the range for a battery. If you want to go beyond that, it's a fuel cell run on hydrogen. And then you have the safety concerns of hydrogen. But these are our problems for the future. Steel. Um, steel is responsible for 8% of CO2 emissions on the planet. It's made in a blast furnace. It uses coke from coal, predominantly in, in, in Europe or China. So if we want green steel, we need green hydrogen in direct reduction of iron ore. So this is a green steel facility in Sweden using offshore wind to make hydrogen. So this brings me to the questions that I'd like to raise, and Brendan might talk about these as well, is how do we maximize the value of wind energy to Ireland? A huge concern I have is that the steel will be produced in Indonesia, it'll be assembled in UAE, it'll come on a ship to Ireland, we'll put the turbines on the east coast, we'll have one cable to Dublin and another cable to Britain. And as we go on, there'll be more connection to Europe. So we'll be sitting here and all my civil engineers will be unemployed because it will come from UAE. So we need to maximize the value to Ireland of this industry. If we're looking at 7 gigawatts, that's going to be 21 billion of an investment in this country. And I'd prefer it to be owned as much as possible by this country rather than all the work being done somewhere else, put into our ocean and our seas and the energy goes somewhere else. Questions I would ask is, we had a steel plant in Cork, uh, Irish Steel, then ISPAT. It closed in 2001. Should we build a green steel facility in Cork so that we are the producers of green steel, a higher economic value? Should we produce ammonia in Cork? Up until 2002, we had uh, an ammonia production facility. We could have green ammonia from offshore wind. Should we produce methanol in Cork or in Ireland? So CH3OH, it's just um, hydrogen from offshore wind, carbon capture from a distillery, uh, an anaerobic digester. Do we integrate hydrogen into circular bioeconomy systems? Uh, so these are difficult questions. I, I, I do worry that all we're thinking about is putting these massive devices in the ocean and I don't know who's thinking about how do we optimize the value to Ireland. Like, I would much prefer to have civil engineers working in Ireland on green ammonia, green steel, green methanol, and all that hydrogen molecules stay in Ireland, and we produce the economic value that we export and we become a wealthy country, as opposed to all those electrons going straight into Rotterdam. And in Rotterdam, they make ammonia, and they sell it back to us at a big price. So there are the questions I have. Um, I want to thank, first of all, our, our funders, Science Foundation Ireland, EPA, SEAI, Interreg, Marie Curie, and, and these are the research team who do all the work. And I want to thank Brendan Tuohy. Brendan Tuohy is the chair of the Marai Centre. He's guided us since 2012. Um, he's also the chair of Airgrid. So I've asked Brendan to give a, a, a real-world commercial perspective so I'll pass you over to Brendan, and I'll, I'll close this guy down. Um, 
I need. It's always difficult to follow the professor of civil engineering in UCC who lectures for a living. Um, yeah. Off to you, Brendan. Thanks, Jerry. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm, I'm doing a much shorter presentation than Jerry. It's a response to Jerry's paper. And you'd be glad to know there's not a real argument between Jerry and myself, because I agree with a lot of what he's saying. I'll just give you a quick overview of Airgrid, because um, obviously it's been in the news a lot in the last year or two. Uh, talk a bit about the offshore stuff as well. Also a bit about the southern region, and some of you may or may not be aware that the country for EU purposes is in three regions, the southern, the eastern, the uh, west, northwest one. Um, and the southern one extends, and I'll show you a map of this later, but broadly across a line from, from Clare across down to Wexford and that. And then taking up Jerry's questions about how do we reposition ourselves and what do we look at, I'd like to take it slightly broader into the, I suppose, the political side of things there. So. Uh, some of my colleagues, uh, Shane, and uh, I think Michelle is here as well, and, um, and James from the Airgrid, my colleagues from Airgrid. It's state-owned, 100% state-owned, and it looks after the grid. We send power from where it's generated to where it's needed, right? We don't actually generate anything ourselves. We run the wholesale market, and we run the interconnectors the, at the moment to the UK, and the new one that Jerry talked about, which I'll talk about later, into France. So we are not a generator. We don't own any of the assets, the transmission systems. They're all owned by ESB networks. But we will own the offshore. Um, just to give you context in the sense of numbers, and there's presumably a lot of engineers here, but we hit our all-time maximum demand on the system of 7,000 megawatts, just 7 gigawatts, just over that, just before Christmas this year. And that's all-island, and we are an all-island body. So. Uh, on Ireland, that's 5,500 on the same day. And then the maximum wind output was about 5,500 megawatts and about 3.6 thousand uh, uh, megawatts for Ireland. The challenge we have, and Jerry referred to, and I'll bring back to this later, is the grid now needs to carry into the future at least another 10 gigawatts more renewables by 2030 than what we have today. So Jerry showed you the figure with that one with the constraint and, and that just over five or six gigawatts. Now we've got to at least ten um, to carry at least ten more ten gigawatts more by 2030. And then the other figure I suppose is worth remembering um, on today's technologies. There's broadly 70 gigawatts of electricity capability offshore Ireland. That's on today's technologies. That's include wind, wave, tidal, and so on. And that's right up the west coast. So that's about, you can do the calculations, that's, that's 70 gigawatts, and we're using broadly today about seven. So that's about 10 times the capacity. So no matter what we do here, there will be an element of how we, how we look at the future, and that's what makes it important. The challenge Airgrid has, I mean, I put it up there as what we call the energy trilemma, the three issues. We balance security of supply. You want your lights to be on. We're moving to renewable energy which isn't guaranteed all the time, as you know. And then at the same time, we've got to watch the price of this thing, the competitiveness, or we'll blow the economy out of the water. So you can do anything you want if you're prepared to pay for it. The other challenge we have is um, you hear a lot about the 80% renewables by 2030. That was, the government changed that a year ago from 70 to 80, and that last 10% is really challenging. But the other side of that is we've been told that we must get the emissions down to 3 million tonnes by 2030. If we were doing nothing today and just brought on the, all the electric vehicles and heat pumps, we'd be up at about 16 million tonnes by 2030. So it's got to go from an effective number of 16 down to 3, which is really, really challenging. Um, give you a few. We, we did, a, we did a th uh, an exercise called Shaping Our Electricity Future, and... We published this in just at the COP26, and there will be a newer version of this coming out because the government have changed the target since then. So you'll have to bear with me on this, but I can't show you the new one just published. But the supply side, you see the offshore, it's um, originally five, and now there'll be another two added to it. The onshore is going up by 1.3 gigawatts, and the solar, one gigawatt. Microgeneration, which is really important, the public really want this. 
and then the conventional, we need conventional gas of 2.2 and then batteries both long and short. But you can see the demand by 2030 on the electricity grid is going up 50%. And by any standards, that's fairly significant. About 30% of that will be data centers, or just shy of 30%. Again, just to show you what that looks like on a map, that's the, the generation in 2020. And you can see the, the brown areas in that that are the, the, you know, from the gas and stuff, the pieces effectively gone, the coal is still there down in money point. But you can see the movements then by 2030, all of that, um, obviously the, 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 the coal in that is gone, but you can see the offshore wind coming in on the right. I mean, Dublin as an area itself uses about a demand at the moment of about 1.8 gigawatts. For interest, Cork has about, uh, uses about 250 gig, uh, megawatts and uh, produces about 350 megawatts in the Cork area. So, the infrastructure needed to deliver all of that by 2030, huge number of projects, close to 300. And you can see where, the, where these are going to take place. Like the challenge is the electricity being generated is off, generally off the coast, or sorry, on the, the periphery on the west side. The demand is on the east coast and around Dublin. That's a huge challenge. And as Jerry said, we have very limited interconnection, about two gigawatts at the moment. And we let sorry, about one gigawatt at the moment, and we'll be adding to that. Again, that's another shipping electricity future. It lists out all those projects, and that's just them put on a map. And you can see rolling out physical infrastructure today in Ireland is really challenging because you'll get lots of objections and so on. I'm glad to see that on one of the projects that we've done that Jerry referred to, which is the Celtic Interconnector, uh, it's a 1.6 billion project. Brussels has put up, the EU has put up 540 million. It's nearly 600 kilometers long. It's a 700 megawatt project. And I went through Borp Planola without any oral hearing because the, the team worked very closely with the community. And that's sort of the challenge, I think, for the future. If you can do this, because the timeline is really important. This is going to be big, and then that's obviously going to be the start of something else. If we were doing this project today, probably cost twice the price and probably would take us five years more because there's such a demand for ships and for production of the cable and so on internationally. Taking up what Jerry said then, that like we talk about, um, look, we, Airgrid is going to own and develop, and the government and the Oireachtas have said that this would be a planned out approach. That in other words, the onshore wind has come about from developer led, the developer decides where to put it, but the offshore is going to start with the East Coast, but moving transitioning and then ultimately to plan that where Airgrid will say this is what the infrastructure, this is where the grid is going to be. And coming out of that though, I think there's a need, and this is a, a sort of picking up on Jerry's point, that we need an overarching sort of framework that yes, we can provide the electricity on the grid, but the real challenge here is what are the type of industries do we want in Ireland in the future? Picking up some of the points that Jerry made, which I'll come back to, we'll have indigenous Irish companies that want to increase and see an opportunity there. We'll have foreign direct companies wanting to come in here saying we're really interested because we want to be near where the energy is. And then the potential for export that Jerry talked, that Jerry talked about. Planning the offshore grid, well, Airgrid is going to be, it's mandated to do that and that's going ahead. Huge investment needed. Um, Airgrid's investment program between now and the end of the decade is about three billion alone, just for Airgrid. Um, the onshore, offshore, the offshore is going to be a huge long-term investment. If you look at the UK numbers for the dollar bank, it's about three, um, three billion for every gigawatt of offshore energy, ballpark figures. So go back to the early number I said, 70 gigawatts off Ireland in today's numbers, multiply that by three, you're up at over 200 gig, um, billion of investment. It's a phenomenal amount of money, right? But it's not just the offshore. Jerry referred to the ports, really important for the ports. And it's also the education and training side. There's no point having all of this if we don't build the skills base here to, to avail of it and make the most of it. And then the engaging the communities, I think, is absolutely critical. And, and Michelle here is very involved with the project, um, the Celtic Interconnector. But, you know, that is going to be critical. If we don't bring the communities with us, this is not going to happen, and particularly in the timeline. So we need the policy backdrop for that. Um, I just put forward a... a the, the experience in Cork of the pharma industry in the 70s, we decided that Ireland should look at this, and we didn't have a pharma industry. 
and we decided, look, what do we need? What, do the, what will attract these companies in? They need a land bank with planning designation, so Ring of Skiddy, that whole area, about 200 acres. Roads, clean water, electricity, deep water, Bert was built, and then educated and skilled people. Um, putting all that together, we now have nine of the top 10 farm industries. Their export value at the moment is close to about 30 billion a year. Um, and during COVID, you could see, and you see our numbers, we're up at 14% GDP growth this year, uh, and potentially. And this is because of the multinationals, but we have put together the right infrastructure and the right skills in the country. So going back to that southern region, and just putting it to Jerry's point there and taking that, like what are the type of industries we could see? The southern region has a plan, but none of this is in it. Um, but we really do need to sort of conceptualize this. And again, way back a number of years ago, a friend of mine, a sociologist, said that the future is a social construct, and it's created by people talking about it. You don't sail into the future. You create the future. So it's up to us to create the future. It's up to us to talk about these issues and not leave it to someone else to make up their mind about what should happen. And I'll just pull a few final comments if I could. Meeting the climate targets, absolutely really challenging. Will we do them? Well, I don't know, but we, we'll give it our best shot collectively. Um, everyone needs to be on board. I think we need this concept of what are the industries of the future going to look like in Ireland? Because there's no point starting, we can do the energy side, but it's what the industries are going to look like. Um, there's a significant amount of capital needed, and it's not just in the infrastructure, the traditional, it's in the education, it's in the research side as well. I know in, in Netherlands, when you're building this type of infrastructure, you're, you have to put 5% into research, local research, and that has a 40x return for the, for the community. That's 40x. Right? So this is not just uh, donating money, this is real investment. Recruiting the skilled people, rolling out the infrastructure, again, will only happen with meaningful engagement. And this idea here about when we did the offshore oil and gas, there was a percentage of that for, for training people, petroleum, um, for PhDs and stuff, 5% or whatever percentage. Um, also, that should be there. And then the final point I'd make on that one is that we talk a lot about the just transition, and we look particularly at the Midlands losing on jobs. But I think another element has to be added into this, which is the communities that are going to take the hit on the infrastructure need to be rewarded accordingly. Um, otherwise, like you won't see many wind turbines in Dublin City, Dublin County, but they will avail of the electricity. Some are, so this idea of looking, re-looking at the definition of just, of just um, transition I want to just pick up on Jer Jerry's comments about that future thing and, and just take it up to a different level. I mean, we've seen what's happened with Ukraine and we've seen Germany being 100% depend, dependent on, you, on um, Russian gas. If you look at where Germany came out of, where the EU came out of, it came out of the European coal and steel community. Coal and steel. That's still the essence of where this started. The Ruhrgebiet in Germany, huge industry. But it came out from the from the energy side, and that was coal. And I suppose there's a part of me that says that, well, that's what has grown up over the years. Can we envision something and look at something that's really different? What about a Europe then where you said that, well, where's the energy going to be in the future? It's going to be in the peripheral regions. Well, why wouldn't the industry move to the peripheral regions then, or some of the industry, maybe not all of it, but like, rather than just us shipping the electrons to feed they take the, the big beast in Germany, and this is, I'm not anti-German, but, um, but we should think differently. That We've always been seeing ourselves in, in Ireland and other countries as the peripheral. But actually, when you look at green energy, and that's the essence of what we're talking about, BASF, just before Christmas, probably the biggest company in Germany announced that they were moving some of their operations to Asia because the price of energy wasn't, wasn't good, and the, they hadn't a guarantee on, on that for the future. We are in a, a really interesting position geopolitically on this as well. So I'm just thinking that we shouldn't hold back as a country on this. Like, and finally, to pick up on Jerry's final, just to endorse Jerry's comments, we've got to think big and well beyond the boundaries of Ireland, think into the EU stuff, and don't be afraid. You know, um, We think about the molecules, not just the electrons, and the opportunity of the products that go with it. So we've got effectively unlimited green energy, at a good price, hopefully. And then we create the value in Ireland 
as opposed to creating the value abroad. In the 50s, we shipped cattle abroad, cattle on the hoof. The value was created abroad. The, it, beef in, the, the agriculture industry is in two distinct parts, beef and dairy. The dairy industry uh, decided that we can't just do milk. So they started making food products and high value products, all around research and so on. That industry today, the food, that side of the food industry is worth 20 billion, close to 20 billion, 200,000 people working in it. By contrast, the fishing industry today is worth about a quarter of a billion and has 15,000 people working on it. The challenge for us is do we want to be closer to the concept of the food industry with that, with the value added, or are we willing to settle for the fishing industry with 15,000 people and a quarter of a billion? So I'll leave it to you to decide, but thanks for your attention. Just one final slide, I should say. When the Native Americans in the, the tribe in Manhattan were approached by the Dutch back in, in the uh, 1626, they sold the island of Manhattan for 20 guilders or whatever, about 60 pounds or that's 60 dollars, whatever. They didn't know the value of what they had. We know it today, the value. And I'm just saying, let's not do the same with the offshore, with the energy and with the, the value that we have there. Thank you.